Hi, this is Carmen Medina. And a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the science and art of diverse thinking. And I think this is a topic that is very relevant to Rebels at Work. So I'd like to share it here. So I like to make my presentations or, or open them with a picture of my mom and dad getting their Puerto Rican on. I'm Puerto Rican by birth, Texan by nationality. So I kind of come naturally diverse. Uh, I ended up working at CIA and I spent 32 years there. Here's a picture of me in Afghanistan with my security guards. I tried to obfuscate their faces and just ended up turning them into Picasso pictures. Anyway, at CIA, I began to believe, for example, in the mid 1990s that the internet was gonna end up being transformative and that knowledge organizations like CIA needed to embrace the internet. And this gave me a reputation for being a heretic. And that indeed I was. I always or almost always could see or imagine a different way of doing things in the way we were currently doing it than the prevailing orthodoxy. When I retired, I began to speak and write about this. One of my early talks, Lois Kelly heard me. She coined the phrase rebels at work. We wrote the book uh, more than three years ago where we capture many of the lessons she and I learned about being diverse thinkers in large and often stodgy organizations. Adam Grant has subsequently profiled me in one of the chapters in Originals. Now to get back to my South Africa career, I uh, was the manager of the South Africa branch in the 1980s, and we had a very important and stimulating account. We were trying to figure out how and when apartheid would end, and our team was just about evenly divided between people who thought that the whites would never give up, and the only way you would get black majority rule would be through a bloody conflagration and others who thought both black and white attitudes were changing and this other half believed that black majority rule would occur sooner than people were expecting and much more peacefully. So this was very challenging for me as a manager because I somehow had to navigate such a deeply divided group. And, you know, we all read the same information. They all, for better or worse, worked for the same person. We spent all our time together. We were very collaborative. I finally concluded that the reason why we were so divided had to, or what accounted for where you stood on the issue was whether you were an optimist or a pessimist. If you were an optimist about life in general, you tended to, to think that black majority rule could occur peacefully. And if you were not, you didn't. And so that also began my fascination with how we think. I'm much more interested in understanding how we generate good ideas, how we diverse, how we harvest diverse thinking than I was in any particular part of the world. So, but I also know it's very hard to harvest diverse thinking that, and we don't talk enough about how to do it. So what I'd like to do now is share some of my thoughts on the science and art of diverse thinking. The science part is drawn from, in large part, from these two books, Rebels in Group, Groups, a uh, textbook that was published uh, a few years ago that summarizes much of the recent research on deviance and dissent in teams and organizations and makes the case that it leads to good outcomes, not bad outcomes, and more recently, just this year, in fact, the Diversity Bonus by Scott Page, where he makes a very compelling case about how organizations need to assemble teams with an eye toward the right mix of talent to handle the challenge that they're, they're trying to tackle. So now on the science and art of diverse thinking. So just a few points. Diversity leads to better outcomes, even when the centers are wrong. So you'll get a situation where someone who's uncertain, who kind of knows that maybe there's a different uh, solution to the problem, they will welcome different thinking, or they might. But the person, the know-it-all, who's sure that they are right, is much less likely to identify, to welcome different thinkers. And that's a mistake because diversity leads to better outcomes in organizations, even when the dissenters are subsequently proven to have been wrong. 
So what's going on there? The exchange of views leads to everyone raising their game. The ones who hold the, what turns out to be correct opinion, research a little harder, do a few more case studies, talk to a few more people, and as a result, your outcome improves over what it could be. Now, Scott Page makes the point, and it's a useful one, that diversity is not as important for routine tasks. That if you're just executing a particular protocol, that maybe you don't need diversity of thought, it might even be harmful. I, I, I know what he's saying. I don't completely agree, because I think that sometimes when you get involved in a routine task, you tend to forget or not even notice that the environment or the circumstances are changing around you and that maybe your routine isn't as suited for this new environment as it used to be. And I think the only people who are going or the people most likely to see this growing in balance between your routine and your external environment are the ones who think differently. It's a great phrase, you shouldn't just worry about the soup but also about the kettle that you're cooking, the soup. And in organizations, routines are the kettle. And sometimes you need to think about the kettle from a systemic purpose, uh, perspective, and only diverse thinkers are likely to do that. Diverse thinking outperforms even the smartest expert. Now, I like this a lot. Now, the first thing I should say, however, is you probably don't know who this woman is. And I included this picture for the reason that too often we default to sort of familiar icons to illustrate points, like the person I should have included to illustrate intelligence or the smartest expert is Albert Einstein, right? He's the internet uh, icon for intelligence. But when we default to the same kind of person over and over again, we're non-diverse and what we're telling people who don't identify themselves in the picture of Albert Einstein that um, maybe their opinion won't be welcomed or they won't be easily heard. So this person is actually Cecilia Payne. She was the first woman to get a PhD in astronomy from Harvard. She discovered what stars are made of. In other words, using spectral analysis, she determined the composition of the universe. And if you want to know more about her, she's uh, written up in an interesting book called The Glass Universe. But back to the point that diverse thinking outperforms even the smartest expert. You're, uh, you're, even if you're the smartest person, you can become even smarter by including the opinions of others. Scott Page uses the example of the Netflix challenge where the winning team in the challenge from a few years ago to develop a better algorithm, the one that was doing the best still was not improving the algorithm enough to win, I think it was a million dollar Netflix prize. Only when the winning or best performing team combined their efforts with some of the other teams in the competition that they actually cross the threshold so that they could win the prize. So even if you think you're the smartest person in the room, there are things that you can learn and improve your overall expertise by listening to others. Diverse thinking correlates to better outcomes, right? There's a lot of correlation, not a whole lot of causality on this. So for example, the Billboard 100, most of the songs in the Billboard 100 are composed by teams, not by individuals. The same is true with articles in academic journals. The ones most highly cited are composed by teams or written by teams, not by individuals. The problem is that it is only correlation. And, and there's a downside, there's a cost to these diverse teams, which is that they are fraught with diversity tension. So Scott Page makes the point that diverse teams may actually be outperforming homogeneous teams by wide margins, but because of this diversity tension and the inefficiency that it brings to the team process, 
their outcomes or their better performance is diluted, is not as apparent. So diversity tension, the arguing, the trying to resolve things, the letting everyone have their say actually makes everything take longer. And dealing with differences of opinion leads to a less smooth process. And one of the things, and I think one of the reasons why we don't do a good enough job harvesting diversity attention is that managers aren't equipped, aren't given the skills to deal with it better. So that's what I want to turn to now, which is the art of diverse thinking. And most of these are best practices that I've learned and that I've gathered from others. Again, there's not as much science ab about this. So one, don't demand courage from diverse thinkers. This, this is very common. We do this almost without realizing we're doing it. So when we say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or uh, we've always done it this way, you're actually raising the bar for the person who thinks differently, and you're asking them to be courageous, to risk a little bit of their prestige on the team, to raise their hand and say, yeah, but... So as a manager, stop saying those things. Don't insist upon courage to hear a diverse point of view. Watch your language in every respect. And there's so many things I could say here. One of my favorite phrases that is totally counterproductive is, don't bring me a problem unless you have a solution. Whoever thought of that phrase should be shocked. What are you actually saying to that person? First, you're saying that they, that, that, it's all about the individual, that they personally have to come up with a solution, when in fact, shouldn't the solution be a team effort? You're a NASA scientist. You're pretty sure that that asteroid is going to hit the Earth, but you don't know what to do about it, so you're not going to say anything. It's a ridiculous comment. And there's so many other language ticks that we have, like we say any comments at the end of our presentation and all we hear is crickets. We need to ask much more direct questions. What did I get wrong? What am I missing? How would you do it differently? If you want to harvest diverse thinking more effectively, work out loud and collaborate from the beginning. I think a lot of time people with a different idea will hesitate to speak up. The manager doesn't give them a signal that this kind of discussion is welcome. And as a result, when they say something, it's too late. It's not collaboration anymore. It's just deconfliction. You need to collaborate with your diverse ideas at the start of a project. Encourage productive conflict. Now, how do you encourage productive conflict? I think this is going to differ from team to team. But as I was putting my presentation together, I came across this great list of uh, code of conduct for diverse teams that I thought could help you create the conditions for productive conflict. In addition to the ones she has here, she's thinking of adding uh, two more, which is listen attentively or listen generously and be accountable. So I think to have productive conflict, you need to have ground rules established from the beginning. The streetlight effect, it's this story that someone is looking for their car keys at late at night or, or something late at night and a policeman sees them. The policeman says, what are you looking for? My car keys. The policeman goes, is this where you lost them? And the person says, no, under the street light is the only place I can see. That's what happens to homogeneous teams. Their light shines in only one frequency. And so they operate based only on what they can see. And yet there's a lot of useful information that is hiding in the corners that only different diverse thinkers can see. So invite those people into your organization and let them shine different kinds of lights so that you can be more effective. Thanks.